let me turn finally then to uh, Judith Randall to talk about the data challenges and exploring the role of these new flows and actors we've been talking about. Judith is uh, Director uh, of Development Initiatives, which is uh, an interesting organization specializing in access to information and data for poverty eradication. Uh, that's been uh, Judith's mission for a long time, uh, both in DI and before that as um, uh, Director of Public Affairs with Tony German at uh, ActionAid. Uh, Judith's involvement with this goes back to launching the first of the Reality of Aid reports uh, way back in the early 90s. So it's a long track record, Judith, of uh, following this area. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you very much. If you don't mind, I'll stand up. Um, I want to talk about uh, getting data to work for poverty eradication, and I want to talk about it really from the perspective of people who use the data, which includes us, but includes a lot of people who are very, very far from the discussion that's taking place in this room. Um, I'm also, to pick up Andrew's point, from an organisation that is relentlessly focused on resources for poverty eradication. I think it's extraordinarily interesting how projecting forward the trends on poverty eradication has led to this great sense of confidence that poverty will be eradicated in a short time frame. I think the Revalian quote, though slightly less eloquent than the President, is the significant one in the middle there. But there's almost, from this morning's discussion, a sense that poverty eradication might be the end of history. We're talking about people people living on $1.25 a day. This is a minimum level as part of social progress. And we will need development financing data and other data that will help us make progress on a whole role of other range of other goals. As Richard said, we've worked on lots of different accountability reports over the years. But our focus is overwhelmingly now on what almost everybody has been talking about, which is global investments to end poverty, looking at domestic resources plus all resources and how those can best be harnessed to the goal of, of poverty eradication. I was really struck this morning by the sense that we are a little bit victims of the way we classify things ourselves. And we're almost like in a sort of 19th century Wesleyan debate about who's going to go to heaven because they've defined uh, things in a particular way. And I think, it's, I think it's a risk. I think it also really affects the way we see and interpret the world. And the people in this room are the people who both use and retail data to create a view of the world which then influences policy and spending. So that's the, uh, the angle that I'm going to be coming to this from. Sorry, I've got so many bits of kit here, I'm not quite sure which one I'm using. Um, so the first thing about data, and I'm not <coughs> going to dwell on this much, but I think it is the fundamental thing on poverty eradication, is data on who is poor and who is moving out of poverty and who is moving into poverty and where they are and what their names and addresses are. And we are way, way, way too ignorant about that. And the differences between different estimates are extraordinarily large. So the big question is how are we going to both do and know that we've done uh, progress towards poverty eradication without better data on who is in poverty and who moves into and out of poverty over time. And I think this is the big change that we should all think about. Somebody said this morning, should we be talking about people in poverty rather than countries in poverty? If you look at the, the Chronic Poverty Research Center does a lot of data on panel data looking at who moves into and out of poverty. So if you look at the big picture on Ethiopia, poverty drops from 61% to 46%. But 30% of people have stayed poor, 15% of people have moved into poverty. You need that type of subnational data or disaggregated data to make progress. The colours haven't come out the same way as they did on my <laughs> presentation this morning. Um, there's a big debate here, as everybody from Britain will know, about whether Britain should give aid to India, and the Secretary of State has just made an announcement on that. Every Daily Mail reader knows that India is a middle-income country. India is a middle-income country by a whisker. The yellow to blue line is the low-income to middle, lower middle-income division. The one at the top is the lower to upper middle-income. So by a whisker, India is a middle-income country. But somehow we've allowed that data to completely obscure the fact that 350 million people thereabouts, you know, we don't quite know. 350 million people in India, as many as in sub-Saharan Africa, are living on less than a dollar a day. So we allow these classifications to determine spending decisions and policy because we're using national level data. If we, partly because we're using national level data, if you rank countries along with Indian states for the largest numbers of people living in 
this is multidimensional poverty for data reasons, um, then 11 out of the 20 countries with the largest numbers of people under a dollar a day would be Indian states. So we absolutely have to move, in my opinion, to using subnational data, not national data. Now, you can make excuses for the lack of progress on better data of people, on people in poverty. But there's a much less excuse for our poor data on resources. Resources are, data on resources are on somebody's computer somewhere. They're an electronic transaction. We should be able to get at this data. And we are much, much too much focused <laughs> on uh, ODA as the central metric that we use. So this graph here is just showing you the number of countries for whom ODA was the major resource <coughs> in 1990, just under 100, and the number for whom it's the major international resource now, 37. ODA is not the metric that we should be using, but we need to be very careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater on this, because if you do the analysis by region, country, sub-region, you will find that ODA is really significant for many people and for many things. So <coughs> sub-Saharan Africa on the far right, ODA is the red bar at the bottom, much, much more significant than, than any other region. But it's only going to be effective if we have the data to use it in combination with other resources so that you can, get, you can lever the other resources and you can get better value. The other... Um, Okay, I'm not going to go into this, but maybe in questions we should discuss the issue about the fragile states definition. <laughs> Mr. Ali from Malawi, I don't know whether he's here. He was on the list. So Malawi is a fragile state. So is Iraq. So is Nigeria. The really significant thing is that when you do almost any work for any group of donors, they say, well, don't forget to give a classification for fragile states. So it really matters to Malawi whether it gets a classification as a fragile state because it will affect all sorts of spending decisions. But is the policy response for Malawi, Nigeria and Iraq going to be at all common? I don't know. Um, now, uh, going to ODA, I think we need to radically change as well the way that we address uh, data on ODA and the way that data on resources for poverty reduction are campaigned on. This is the classic NGO campaigning graph, very popular in the UK, as you can imagine, because it shows the things that are considered not to be good uses of ODA. Um, debt relief, overvalued, valuable, but uh, hugely overvalued. Student costs, refugee costs, technical cooperation, also considered often to be an inefficient or expensive form of giving aid. And NGOs have been campaigning on these issues for probably decades, actually definitely decades. Actually, the growth in student costs and the growth in refugees in donor countries as uses of ODA has grown faster than ODA as a whole. So the campaigning clearly hasn't been effective, and it wouldn't be, because there is no traction around these issues. So we need to focus both on the big amounts of money and the things that are likely to achieve change. Now... One of the areas that Homi touched on, which I think is an absolutely fundamental thing we have to improve in terms of data and how we get more value that's very relevant to people here, is <coughs> when we're looking at the impact of aid, I often find myself asking when I'm reading these things, how could we possibly know? So when you're looking at macroeconomic impacts of aid, for instance, um, and people take ODA as one bundle of funding, how are you possibly going to make this judgment? Because ODA is made up without any value judgment about these things of some of its money, some of its people, food, commodities, some of its things which are definitely not transferred, it may or may not be appropriate, some of it's all mixed together. And when we're comparing countries, the balance is hugely different. These countries are all deemed to be similarly uh, aid dependent, but the just the composition of the ODA resources are so different that it would be very misleading to take the ODA figures as a whole and then draw conclusions about the impact uh, on, the, on the economy. So I think we have to be very careful, those of us who are retailing <coughs> data, to ensure that the data we're using, we're not supporting continued poor data, we're driving improvements in, um, in other data. So, finally, good news, all of which people have talked about today, and which I think also gives us an opportunity, those of us who are analysts, to try and uh, improve the information that we have for poverty eradication. 
the International Aid Transparency Initiative is publishing data on transactions, on geocoded information. More than 70% of DAC donors are now uh, committed to publishing to the International Aid Transparency Initiative. We need to start using this data and demanding that it get better and better. The whole open data and open government movement is also putting data in the public domain that people are desperate to be able to use really well. Um, and on the po linking this to the poverty data, there's an increasing amount of information that is about registration. In Brazil, Brazil's extremely ambitious poverty eradication program, which uh, aims to eradicate extreme poverty by 2015, and is based around the central registry, which allows Brazil to target resources, not just income, but other resources, um, <laughs> to particular, uh, particular people uh, in Brazil. There are initiatives which uh, have registration cards, which have identity, which allow uh, resources to be targeted and which put data on real people and their changing circumstances into the public domain. If we can combine and use these types of data with the resource data, then we can start to, uh, to contribute more. And I think what we need is some sort of virtuous circle that gets this much more diverse and maybe more realistic information used and increases the, dri the drive for better data. Thanks very much.